Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our COVID-19 webinar series. Great to see so many people joining us here this Wednesday morning, January 27th. I'm Kristen Uhlenbrock. I'm your host for your, this series, and I work at the Institute for Science and Policy together with my Denver Museum of Nature and Science colleagues and our partners at the Colorado School of Public Health. We are really excited to have you joining us today for episode number 25. We're going to be talking a little bit about our national response and some of the public health landscape. Joining us today is a really esteemed guest. We have Dr. Frieden joining us. Um, he is an influential leader and physician with advanced training in internal medicine, infectious disease, public health, and epidemiology. He is currently the president and CEO of a global health, infection, a global health initiative called Resolve to Save Lives. Uh, you may also know him. He was previously the director of the CDC from 2009 to 2017. He was also served as the commissioner of the New York City Health Department. He is definitely a preeminent voice on our current pandemic, as well as our public health landscape. And we are thrilled that he's joined us this morning. Good morning, Dr. Frieden. How are you today? Good morning. Thanks very much. And it's great to be here with you. I wish I were out in Colorado so I could go hiking uh, now but uh, or skiing. Uh, but it's great to be with you virtually. Great. Yeah, we actually just had a little bit of snow for the past day or two, too. So I'm sure many of us are itching to get out in the, in the mountains and enjoy our weekends ahead. Um, OK, so I'm going to turn this over to him. He has a presentation to kind of help set the stage. And then we're going to spend, of course, the latter half in Q&A. Um, but I do want to just give a quick nod to those of you who are on Twitter. Um, I encourage you to follow, actually, Dr. Uh, Frieden on Twitter. He's pretty prolific, and he's got this COVID epi weekly thread that he does every Friday with a lot of great data and perspectives. Um, so definitely, if you're on, on Twitter, follow him at Dr. Uh, Tom Frieden to kind of stay up to date. Um, I really enjoy seeing what he has to say every week. So uh, thank you. Let me turn this over to you. And why don't you kick us off a little presentation before we head into discussion? Thank you, Kristen. And thanks for mentioning the Friday evening threads. I actually started those uh, in uh, exactly a year ago uh, because there was so much happening so quickly. And at the end of the week, it was possible to kind of do a roundup of where things were. So thanks for that mention. Uh, what I'd like to do is just take us through some slides about COVID and also the future more generally. Um, what we are seeing is that uh, there keeps, uh, what I keep hearing from different parts of uh, the world, from different people, is what's the one thing that's going to make COVID go away? And unfortunately, no one thing is going to make COVID go away. We're going to have to prevent spread with layered interventions. And the good concept there is of the Swiss cheese model, interventions that keep people from getting infected. Each of those layers has some impact on reducing the risk, whether that's distancing, masks, um, increasing ventilation, uh, avoiding uh, going out if you're sick. Um, but each of them has holes. And if you see the little mouse there, that's the misinformation mouse. And every bit of misinformation increases the holes in the Swiss cheese. Now, vaccination is also enormously important. It's the single most important tool that we have. But even with the vaccine, it's crucially important that we box the virus in to stop cases from, from becoming clusters and clusters from becoming outbreaks. And in fact, I'll go over why it's even more important that we do that now. The three W's reduce the risk of COVID, wear a mask, watch your distance, and wash your hands, to which we would add the two V's, uh, ventilation and vaccination. Now, assessing risk, we talked earlier about hiking and skiing. The risk of infection really, you can think of as the product of the prevalence in the community, the proportion of people not wearing masks, the level of ventilation with outdoors being best, the number of people you're exposed to, and the duration and intensity of exposure. So if you're outdoors in a low prevalence community, there's almost no risk. If you're indoors for a long time with lots of people shouting or singing in a high prevalence community without masks, that's the highest risk. And just a couple of hours ago, uh, the New York Times released, uh, I believe not behind a paywall, um, a map of the US by county that we worked with them on to indicate the level of risk in each county in the US so that we can empower people to know what is the level in in essence, how hard is it raining COVID in your community? 
Now, the box it in strategy we released long back, and it remains relevant. In fact, I argue that it's even more important in the context of vaccines and variants, because the more uncontrolled spread there is, the greater the risk that there will be uh, variants that emerge that can evade either our natural immunity or vaccine-induced immunity. So far, that hasn't happened, but it's clearly possible. And for that reason, we need to dually increase vaccination and also improve our comprehensive protection protocol work. The box it in strategy talks about testing strategically. So you're rapidly identifying people with infection, isolating all infected people, finding everyone who's been in contact with infected patients and quarantining all contacts. This is the essence of effective measures. And to be very frank, we haven't done a very good job at this for the past year. And we're going to have to do a better job of it in 2020, even with, and especially with a vaccine. Testing is particularly important for anyone with symptoms of COVID, for anyone asked or referred to get tested, for anyone who's been in close contact with someone who has COVID, for anyone in a congregate setting, for essential workers, for those exposed to people who are sick around people not wearing face coverings um, or not keeping safe distance or people who are homeless. Now, this is a really important slide and concept. These are resources for either isolated cases or quarantined contacts. It's crucial that we provide incentives to manage isolation and quarantine with really strong wraparound services. And here's the bottom line about isolation. You wanna make it so appealing that people wanna get into it, not out of it. And I'm not kidding. Every community needs to make isolation and quarantine so appealing that people are not going to avoid it. And what you see in the three columns on this slide are best practices from around the country and around the world on how that works. A care package to every single person who's isolated with masks, thermometers, support for food, laundry, pharmacy services, health education materials. My favorite from around the world uh, was on-demand movies, unlimited Netflix for the two weeks of isolation, eBooks, learning channels, uh, um, tablets, other things to help people access high-speed internet, hotspots, hand sanitizer, alcohol-based cleansers, a note, a letter from a government leader. In a, an optimal response, every single person who's sick or exposed would be identified early and given this kind of support. In addition, resources, daily check-in calls, instructions on how to keep clean, a hotline in case people get sick or need counseling, uh, garbage removal may be needed in some places, telehealth, and if requested, uh, removal to a safe and desirable place, maybe a hotel with services there. Financial support. Uh, the best practices around the world pay people so that they can afford to not go to work for those 10 or 14 days. This is crucially important because the more people isolate, the better we can get back to normal. Vaccines are safe. They're effective, they protect our family and community, but rollout is taking months. They hold the prospect of an eventual end to the pandemic, but this pandemic is going to end uh, with a whimper, not a bang. It's not going to be over suddenly one day. Vaccine rollout has been slow, complicated, confusing, and potentially controversial. The demand for vaccine is going to outstrip supply for many months, and we have to address inequities, health and economic in the vaccine program. If the vaccination program is operated on a first come, first served basis, it will make inequality worse. This is the most complicated vaccination program in US history. And there are important things we don't yet know. We don't know how long protection will last. Could be a year, could be a lifetime. Only multi-year studies will really help understand that. We don't know how rare serious adverse events will be. So far, extremely rare. We've seen uh, allergic reactions uh, for every 100,000 or two or 300,000 people. Um, some of those have been severe with anaphylaxis. Almost all of them have been, or most of them have been in people with a history of allergy or anaphylaxis before. But then again, about 30% of Americans have some history of allergy. Uh, but that's a rare adverse event. We may see other adverse events, and the key is to be open about that. Can we manufacture any, and distribute enough quickly enough? 
No, but we're hoping that will scale up and we won't have production problems. Will people trust the vaccine? There is a lot of hesitancy and polarization here. The Biden administration released their COVID-19 strategy. And I have to say that this was such a relief because for a year, we have lacked a plan. And I've been writing about this since March. There has not been, until the Biden administration came in, either clear organization or a clear plan or clear communication about COVID. And that's a big part of why we have uh, really uh, pushing 500,000 deaths from COVID in this country. I say 500,000, you may say, well, it's 400,000 in the papers, but there's an underreporting of deaths. If you look at excess mortality, that's clear. So there are seven components to the Biden strategy. Uh, restore trust, mount an effective vaccination campaign, stop spread through public health measures, expand emergency relief and use the Defense Production Act, safely reopen schools, businesses, and travel while protecting workers, protect those most at risk, and advance equity, including across racial, ethnic, and urban rural lines, and restore US um, activities globally and build preparedness for future threats. It's important that we address the needs of COVID-19 and beyond. That includes improving infection prevention and control in healthcare settings, because uh, on an average year, about 70,000 people die from infections that they get um, in healthcare settings. We need to expand broadband internet. This is as essential as mail delivery or roads or electricity. And what we're seeing is deserts, not just in rural areas, but also in central cities where a third of school kids where I live in New York City don't have rapid internet to be able to get on, the in, on and do distance learning. We'd like them to be learning in person, but for the economy, for education, broadband internet is essential. Reorienting healthcare to primary care, and I'll talk more about this, including scaling up telemedicine, team-based care, and financial incentives for prevention to preserve and improve health. Sustained funding for global health security to tamp down COVID and protect America's health defenses. And a stronger city, state, and federal public health presence with sustained support. Primary care is the most needed and most neglected part of our healthcare system. Public health improves the efficiency of our health system to keep the whole population healthier. And it's incredibly important that these two areas work together. I know that Denver Health is really a model of collaboration. It's one of the very few places in the country, and in fact, in the world, where you have a good collaboration between uh, public health uh, and uh, primary care and the hospital system. Everyone can do better, but it's, uh, it's good to have uh, seen the progress there. These are uh, two of the saddest graphics uh, you will ever see. Um, over the past 40 years, the U.S. has gone from having a life expectancy near the average for upper income countries um, um, to want a life expectancy on the bottom graph that is substantially below. Uh, we live now on average two or three years shorter lives with more time disabled than most other upper income countries. And it wasn't that way just a few decades ago. And we're paying more and more for our healthcare. We are a negative outlier. And again, we were at the top of the pack a few decades ago, but now we're an absolute outlier in terms of how much we spend and yet how young we die. We need to restructure our health system to maximize health, strengthen public health systems, pay for outcomes by reorienting healthcare delivery to reward providers to prevent illness and empowering individuals to make the healthier decision the default value. We need to focus on simple quality measures, have continuous uh, improvement through information, empower patients, clinicians, and managers, have public reporting, but patient ownership of their data and team-based care that becomes the standard. That means optimal use of nursing, pharmacy, community health workers, and others. Primary care needs to be the center of our healthcare system. Um, there's an overemphasis on specialty care in this country. People who have a primary care provider do better. They live longer. Care has to be patient-centered with clinical encounters at times and places most convenient to patients and uh, minimal or no out-of-pocket costs. These are simple concepts and the 
pandemic actually may allow us to move faster in achieving this. Protecting primary care practices is really important. Many are going bankrupt or facing large administrative burdens because of the irrationality of our current healthcare system. What we should do is change to a capitated per patient model, not per visit or per uh, procedure, and at the same time, do away with a lot of the administrative burden of insurance claims. We can structure payments so they're substantially dependent on improved outcomes and preventing illness and encourage integrated multidisciplinary teams. That will allow doctors to manage bigger panels of patients and use their skills where they're needed most. And it facilitates the involvement of behavioral health, pain and addiction management services, and better programs to address non-communicable diseases. Now, I wanna talk about hypertension for a moment because when you ask a simple question, how can you save the most lives through healthcare? The answer turns out to be control hypertension better. And yet in the United States, we get this most important question right less than half the time. Only 44% of Americans with high blood pressure have it under control, despite spending more than $3 trillion a year on healthcare. Now, we work globally at Resolve to Save Lives, and we've identified five key practices that make a huge difference. One, have a protocol. Kaiser Permanente has a protocol. They've gotten their control rate right up to 90% including Kaiser uh, Colorado, actually, which was one of the first recipients of a million heart recognition program. Second, have good quality drugs and equipment. This is a bigger challenge globally than in the US, but important here. Team-based care, as discussed, patient-centered services, removing barriers to care, and continuous monitoring and improvement, which really was the secret of the Kaiser system, that they had a monthly tracking of how uh, patients were doing. And then I will never forget the call center I saw with 17 pharmacists providing care to 14,000 patients telephonically uh, to ensure that they were optimally cared for. In the context of COVID-19, we need to improve infection prevention and control, reduce the risk of treatment interruption, and innovate with 90-day and 180-day prescriptions, medication delivery, telemedicine, stronger primary care, team-based care, and treatment in the community instead of in hospitals. Globally, we need a stronger public health system, a public health renaissance at national, state, and local levels with a resilient interconnected system that addresses the full range of health threats. We need a dramatically improved public health informatics infrastructure so we have real-time accurate information. We need predictable, sustained, flexible federal funding and a we need to reduce the chasms between federal and state, and frankly, between state and many uh, local public health agencies. We have to end the tobacco epidemic, reduce the heavy burden of harmful alcohol use, protect people from unhealthy food, promote physical activity, reduce air and water pollution, and protect our children from addiction to tobacco, alcohol, drugs, and from predatory marketing by junk food companies. We also have to improve the global health architecture with funding that will cost the world approximately five to $10 billion a year for at least 10 years with technical skills, with more and better trained staff able to transform the money into actual action with operational organizations with more capacity, better governance so that we don't have inappropriate political interference, mechanisms, strengthening the World Health Organization but also identifying new ways and new capacities to improve preparedness globally. And we need to recognize that health challenges are not just about health, they're also about the economy, education, and social development. We can keep this country and the world much safer. Tony Fauci, a good friend said, never again, we should never ever be unprepared for something as catastrophic as what we're going through now. And that means new solutions to prevent, detect, and respond uh, to emerging health threats. We can't afford another multi-trillion dollar pandemic, but we can afford the health security to prevent it. So I will stop there and I look forward to uh, this discussion. Great, thank you, Dr. Frieden. That was um, a really good overview. There's so much there. Um, 
I have a few lightning round questions that we're going to get to later. Um, if you want to pull up your chat, I've kind of queued those up so you can take a glance at them. But I want to start with some of the things you've talked about and, and maybe some bigger picture questions I have as well, too. So earlier on, you were actually showing um, ways of, you know, if we needed to kind of monitor and then really quarantine and do a really targeted approach um, to quarantining, you know, there was a lot of incentives and strategies that you proposed there. Um, not all of them are absolutely being done here in the US, right? And you, it seems like you've pulled from some of these best examples from around the globe. Um, you know, what could we be doing here in the US to, you know, really do that kind of targeted approach and then incentivizing um, people who need to stay home in quarantine? Thank you. What, what I think is first, um, now's the time to begin building and preparing, looking back on what worked and didn't work, building trust with communities, and in each community, identifying the strengths that can be leveraged to support people who are isolating or on quarantine. Working with businesses, for example, to make sure that there is no disincentive for people to be out if they're either ill or if they uh, are exposed. What we've seen repeatedly is that a lot of the spread of COVID is from people coming to work while sick. And we, we should step back and say, why are people doing that? No one wants to work while they're sick. They're doing that because they're having to make a terrible choice between uh, making money so they can put food on the table for their family or potentially putting other people at risk. No one should have to make that choice. So fully paid sick leave is enormously important. And it's part of the new package that's been proposed uh, uh, by the Biden administration. It's extremely important. In fact, the evidence for that is quite clear, including from influenza where paid sick leave can dramatically reduce the spread of influenza in workplaces and in the community more broadly. And then thinking about each community, what can we do to support people either in their own homes or uh, if people uh, want to come out of their home because they're infectious, how can we have that happen quickly? Um, I, I serve on some formal and informal advisory boards for uh, countries and global organizations. And it's been really interesting to see global best practice. In Singapore, for example, their performance standard is that um, within two hours of a positive test result, there will be a video interview with the patient eliciting contacts. Now, we're so far from being there. And we've worked with uh, states and communities around the country. Uh, the challenge now is that we are still so far above the level at which there could be effective contact tracing that it's almost impossible that this would occur now. Um, but we can get ready and we can do tracing in some communities, in some areas, build capacity. And uh, in some communities where people are uh, living in very large households with multi-generational groups, which is somewhat more common in the uh, Hispanic population, um, Latino, Latina Americans and people uh, of, um, in this country, uh, we see more crowding, more risk, and more spread in households. So in Asia, they're really clear. You're sick, get out of the household. You're going to make other people sick, especially if you've got older people or people who are vulnerable in the household. If you don't do that, you propagate another couple of generations of spread of the virus. Thank you for that. Um, also, in one of your slides, when you were talking about the Biden administration's priorities, um, and it's a question we talk a lot about here, which is, you, I think you had just written, restore trust. Um, and we often talk about trust in science, trust in institutions, trust in our public health officials, right? And, and you know, there's a lot of research around public opinion around trust in science, trust in specific agencies, such as the CDC um, and others. So, What's your take on, on restoring trust, maintaining trust, and where are we currently viewing about that? And how does the administration go about doing some of that uh, repairing? Yeah, well, let me say first that I'm really excited. Today, for the first time, there's going to be, a, a, in, a, in a long, long time, there's going to be a briefing by scientists of CDC on where we are with the pandemic. And that will begin uh, three times weekly briefings. Uh, this has been so overdue. Ever since uh, February 25th, when Nancy Messonnier from CDC honestly said, disruption to everyday life may be severe, plan for what you're going to do if uh, you have to close things. And she was basically shut down as was CDC. We haven't heard from the experts. And because of that, I think there's been this growing chasm of understanding. It's crucial that we all get on the same page. Um, Senator Moynihan used to say, you're entitled to your own 
uh, opinion, but not to your own facts. And I feel like we've gotten away from that in this society. If there's one thing we need to do to restore trust is let's agree on the facts. They're, they're, the principles of uh, communication in an emergency are very clear. They're, they're evidence-based and they've been practiced for decades at CDC. Be first, be right, be credible, be empathetic, and give people practical proven things to do to protect themselves, their families, and their communities. And uh, we've seen just an enormous absence of that. Um, we should move forward, but it's also important to understand what went wrong so we can avoid that going wrong in the past. And of all of the failures of the prior administration, I think the most damaging was on communication because we didn't get on the same page. We weren't looking at the same set of facts and that's crucially important to change. So having the CDC and other parts of the federal government speak directly to the American people, brief on what is happening, what we know, that's enormously important. Virtually anything the federal government knows should be public domain in just about real time. That's how we can build and rebuild trust. The other thing I found uh, as CDC director is when you hold a media briefing, there are some really smart journalists out there and they ask tough questions. And some of those questions make you realize that the way you expressed something, maybe it was clear to you, but it wasn't clear even to a very uh, sophisticated audience of these reporters who cover the health beat. So you have to say it better. And sometimes they ask questions that make you go back and look at something differently. And not having that kind of two-way communication, I think is something that led to uh, an increasing gap or chasm between the understanding of this virus by those who are working on it scientifically and the public. And I think the more we can close that chasm, the safer off we'll all be. Thank you, very well said. Um, and, and building on that a little bit too is the idea of course that you know, science is a process. We are living in this real world experiment in real time. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? And so talking about what we do know and what we don't know. Um, and sometimes living on uncertainty and making decisions for individual choice in your family is really, you know, difficult. There's a lot of information out there. Um, and you briefly mentioned this new project um, as part of the New York Times dashboard about the risk map that just was launched today. I think Nicole dropped that link in um, earlier on today. So, you know, what advice and what do you say about people who are trying to assess their own risk um, as it relates to an individual and the different tools that they could use to think about, you know, how do we, how do we, how should we be approaching risk from your perspective? Well, first off, a shout out to the state of Colorado, which has one of the best dashboards in the country on uh, providing that level of risk in each community. Uh, that's what we think the whole country should have with one standard. And we worked with the New York Times to uh, uh, suggest that standard in a way that we think is as close to accurate as you're going to get from the existing information. The idea is that you would know, just as you know, the risk of forest fires or uh, uh, air pollution, ozone, pollen counts, you would know essentially how hard it's raining COVID in your community. And then you could make a choice. I'm not gonna go over to a friend's house today. I'm only gonna walk outside. I'm gonna walk outside, but I'm gonna wear a mask because I may be wear with other people or I'm gonna stay in today because it's raining COVID really hard and I can stay in. I, I think that kind of information will help us get on the same page to understand that um, there is really a risk of COVID. It's extremely high currently. If you look at the risk in the US, the diagnosed rate of COVID per the CDC data is about 50 cases uh, per 100,000 population per day. Um, that's, I mean, it's, these are numbers, but to those of us in epidemiology, those are really high numbers. Um, that's about 10 times higher than the highest number we thought it might be possible to do good contact tracing at. So what we're going to see, I hope, is a, a steady decrease in cases which have begun to come down. But keep in mind, we are at astronomically high rates and we're diagnosing well under half of all of the new infections. We don't know what proportion we're diagnosing, could be a third or a quarter. Uh, we'll see it'll, it's different in different parts of the country depending on how much spread there is and testing there is. But fundamentally what we hope to see over the next few months is a steady decrease in the number of cases. Remember, we never got below 20,000 diagnosed cases a day in this country, and that's a hugely high number. 
We need to get it down to a low number so that we can begin to do that box it in strategy, finding people quickly, stopping cases and clusters from spreading. Even with, and especially with vaccination, it will be necessary to do that for all of this year and probably beyond. Let me pick up on the, the vaccine thread there because we have a ton of questions that came in in advance and during about the vaccine. And, and uh, you know, so let's unpack a few there that I know our audience is interested in. I think we're looking at about 6% of the US has currently at re received the, the first dose of the vaccine. And then I think I saw the number was about 1% is already received the second dose. You know, how is our vaccine rollout going? You know, and I've seen pledges by the current administration on some increases there, but what's your big picture? How are we doing on our vaccine rollout strategy? Well, it's been really bumpy. Uh, and again, um, it's important to understand what went on in the past so that we can avoid problems. Um, a lot of credit to the prior administration for developing the vaccines in record time. Um, Pfizer developed it without uh, warp speed support and then sold to warp speed. Moderna had a wonderful collaboration with the National Institutes of Health to develop their vaccine. And the MRI, mRNA vaccines are really impressive. Uh, this is a new technology. It's been used, uh, it's been thought about before, but it's a new technology and it works way better than any of us had hoped. So it's a highly effective, safe vaccine. And uh, I think all of us should get it as soon as, as it is our turn. Uh, however, uh, the, the approach of the prior administration was essentially to throw it to the states and say, now it's your problem. And that's not going to work. What we need to do is to have a whole of society, whole of government response to understand that there's not going to be enough vaccine. And we've seen a series of problems with the rollout, a lack of information. So really until yesterday, states didn't know in advance how much vaccine they'd be getting a week or two from now. And so that led to a lot of frustration. Appointments scheduled and there wasn't enough vaccine were not scheduled and vaccine not given. About half of all the vaccine that's been distributed is sitting in freezers instead of having been injected into arms. So we're, we, this is a quite a bumpy rollout because of the lack of organization and the lack of collaboration uh, previously. We've seen a page turned with the current administration a collaboration, a joining of hands instead of a pointing of fingers, and a willingness to work with states to identify problems. Uh, they've got a, a lot of cleanup to do. Even understanding what's happening with supply hasn't been clear. Uh, a, a transition usually is a handing of the baton, but in terms of uh, a plan for vaccination uh, nationally, there was there's really no baton to hand here. So the new administration is having to really create that uh, pretty much from scratch. Um, and that's going to take some time. For, for months, we're going to have too little vaccine and we're going to have to prioritize. Uh, I would mention uh, several things that aren't going as well as they need to. First is vaccination in nursing homes. We're seeing high, high rates of uh, nursing home staff not getting vaccinated. We're seeing a lot of doses that were set aside for nursing homes and given to CVS and Walgreens not being given and sitting in freezers because it was basically assumed that everyone would take them, but there are some beds that are empty and people not taking them. That needs to get redistributed quickly, but there never needs to be a time when we don't vaccinate in nursing homes because that's the number one priority. About 38% of all of the deaths in the US have been in nursing homes. And so if we can get that population vaccinated, um, we can drive that down substantially, really within the next two months. So we should be able to see not just falling deaths, which we will see in the coming weeks, but a falling death rate if we can kind of take off the table the most vulnerable uh, population and protect that part of our society better with vaccine. But that means getting the vaccination is done better. So one is to improve how it's going in nursing homes. Good start, you know, over a million people vaccinated in nursing homes, so that's great, but a lot more to be done there, particularly with staff. And remember, nursing homes have a lot of turnover. People come in for a little while, then they go back out to the community. So you need a way to continuously vaccinate the nursing home population. And you need transparency. I would like to see publicly available data on what proportion of residents and staff are vaccinated in every nursing home in the country. And then you can have some pressure from the community. Hey, my, my mom is in that nursing home. Why are only 50% of your staff vaccinated? But also outreach the staff of nursing homes to answer their questions, to address their concerns, to make it easy and convenient. We shouldn't be too surprised that this is a challenge. We've been trying to get 
Uh, flu vaccinations to nursing home staff for decades with not a lot of success uh, or progress, but not as much progress as we should have. Um, the other thing that we need to do much better at is address equity. First come, first serve just perpetuates inequality. You have to reach out to communities that may not have as much access to health care, that may have suspicion about health care and about vaccination specifically. There will need to be uh, vaccinations in communities to make it easy for people because convenience basically outweighs um, hesitancy in terms of vaccine for most people, uh, whether that's in churches or in shopping centers or other places. Um, you need to be proactive uh, and proactive with our messengers and our messengers so that we can reach the populations most at risk. Right. Can I pick up on the equity thread? Because I think, you know, many of us are following what's happening globally and you do work for a global initiative and, you know, vaccine distribution is happening in high income countries right now, those who have been able to secure dosages and provide those. So it is a little bit of a, of a me first sort of strategy right now. So what is our US leadership role and response here to distributing a vaccine globally and, and the interconnectedness of, of how we are in our world um, with the movement of people and goods? There are really two parts to that uh, question, Kristen. One is, uh, what do we do about vaccination? And this is a big problem. I think if we're just honest, every country is gonna look out for themselves first. And that's not ethically defensible, but it's not politically avoidable. So um, what we've seen now is the Biden administration is actually buying more vaccine than will be used or needed in the US. And some of that we would hope would potentially be repurposed for other countries once uh, we've vaccinated the people most at risk here. The US has also committed to joining what's called COVAX. This is the global uh, COVID vaccination facility. That is just getting started. And uh, we need to see what vaccines are available um, and how to get them out. Uh, COVAX is underfunded. So having funds for COVAX is very important. And that's part of the, the plan that's there. And this isn't just about being ethical. This isn't just about doing the right thing. It's also the smart thing. Because if there's uncontrolled spread all over the world, the risk that there will be vaccine escape mutant strains, or even strains that essentially are selected by natural selection for the ability to reinfect people who were infected before, which currently prior infection is pretty protective against getting reinfected, but strains may evolve that evade our natural immunity. So if we don't engage with the rest of the world and help tamp down spread globally, we have the risk that we will be worse off. It's not just about doing the right thing, it's also in our self-interest. And that's true more broadly as well, because um, a health risk anywhere in the world is a threat anywhere else in the world. And yet we work in dozens of countries and with the World Health Organization, which has identified literally more than 10,000 life-threatening gaps in preparedness, in detection systems, rapid response systems, the ability uh, of countries to surge in and stop a threat before it expands, the ability to prevent threats from, threat, from, from spreading. Uh, this is a huge challenge, but also a unique opportunity because literally it's now or never to improve our global health readiness. And that means strengthening early warning systems all over the world, strengthening rapid response systems all over the world. So for example, it shouldn't be more than a week uh, from the time a cluster that may be a new pathogen, a new microbe emerges until it's recognized and not more than another week between the time it's recognized and an effective response starts. That kind of rapid response would make all of us much safer. Great. Um, we've got about five minutes left. I want to do some lightning round, but before we do that, I just want to ask, this is a personal question of me that I have a, con a interesting concern about. I've been seeing, of course, we have a lot of these um, variants um, and variances emerging to the coronavirus um, around the globe, and they're often associated with the country, I think, where they're first observed, right? And so there's the, the UK and then the Brazil and I mean, is there any sort of potential discrimination or stigma, you know, associated with identifying um, or potential backlash, right, by naming a variation out of the country or where we first potentially identify it from a testing standpoint? Absolutely. In fact, we've gotten away from 
uh, naming pathogens by places. And that started with what is now called the sin nombre virus, uh, which was uh, discovered in a part of the US, which I won't name, uh, but uh, without name, because it can lead to confusion. And frankly, South Africa and the UK are looking harder than other places. We don't know that the virus variants started there. They just found it there. Now, you've put some lightning round questions into the chat. Let me see if I can get through them in four minutes. Great. First, um, can people who are vaccinated still transmit the virus? We don't know. Uh, we think it's probably less likely that if you've been vaccinated, you can spread it to others, but it's not certain. The vaccine might not have worked in your case. The variant might have escaped if that happens in the future. And even if the vaccine worked, uh, it's not clear to what extent it prevents you from getting infected, uh, even if you don't get sick, and from shedding that virus and infecting others. So even if you get vaccinated, wear a mask. Second, given studies showing a high proportion of asymptomatic transmission, what do we do to increase testing in the US? We need to make testing much more routine. So start with anyone who's got symptoms and anyone who's a contact to anyone who's got COVID. And then think about a web of um, testing. Anytime you find a cluster, you're gonna test it around that cluster. We're still figuring out the optimal role of antigen tests, but um, rapid testing through antigen and PCR is going to be really important. Herd immunity, what's the national estimate you think we need to reach? Well, first off, herd immunity isn't an on-off on phenomenon. Um, there have been a lot of false dichotomies in uh, this COVID response, open versus closed. We're never fully closed and we're not gonna be fully open for a long time. Um, airborne spread versus not. It's more of a range than a yes, no thing. So the fact is the more people who are either naturally immune from infection or immune from a vaccination, the less the virus will spread. And at a certain level, it becomes much easier to control the virus. Now, sadly, we're already at about 25% of Americans having the infection. Um, that's going to help us with immunity. That was not a route, that was not a way to control the disease because allowing herd immunity to control it through natural infection would have meant as many as a million deaths from COVID in the US. But with vaccination, I think by the, if we vaccinate the high risk groups, nursing homes especially, people over 65 in the coming month or two, then by March, we should see a big reduction in the death rate but the vaccine won't yet have reduced the spread of COVID. By early summer, June, maybe, we should see a reduction in the spread of COVID from vaccination. And I hope if everything goes well, we don't have a variant that escapes vaccination, then by fall, we should be close to or at the new normal, maybe still wearing masks, but able to go to school in person, able to resume most businesses, able to resume a lot of activities with some additional safety measures. But I'd like to see us get to 60, 70, 80% vaccination in the US. What's the efficacy of masks and double masking for the new variants? What should we be doing? Well, we don't know uh, that masks are uh, part of the problem, but we do know a few things. First, for source control, if you've got COVID, even if you don't know it, any mask does a massive amount of good, a cloth mask, any mask. If you wanna protect yourself, a surgical or procedure mask is better than a cloth mask in general. And an N95 or KN95 is better than a surgical mask. So what we hope to see is much more supply of these better masks so that people can use them. What antibody tests are available and how accurate are they? It's a blood test, it's cheap, it's quick, but most of them are not very accurate. So we really want to see more accurate antibody tests on the market and understand if there is a test that correlates with immunity, because right now we don't have that. And finally, who should take the lead on improving the global health architecture? That's a great question. It can't just be the US. It can't just be rich countries. That's an old and outmoded form of global health. We need a global collaboration to make the world safer. And that means leadership from the global south, from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America, from elsewhere, from the Middle East, as well as commitment from the upper income countries. And it's going to mean increased resources from all of us, from the upper income countries, as well as from low and middle income countries to grow their public health workforce in a sustainable way and uh, improved technical information sharing with building capacity of people around the world to better 
um, implement public health programs that can find stop and health stop, find stop and prevent health threats and improve health not just against infectious diseases but also against today's leading killers cancer heart disease stroke diabetes there's so much more we can do we can stop covid and when we do that we shouldn't stop there we should also stop so much of the preventable illness injury disability and death that we suffer through and don't need to if we work together well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Frieden. Wonderful job on that lightning round there, I have to say. Um, great pleasure for having you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all. Great. Thank you for our audience today, too. Um, as you all know, we get a million questions both in advance and during our chat. We do not get to all of them, but we'd love to see them. Thank you for being a very engaged audience. Thank you for tuning in today. Um, we are do have permission to share Dr. Frieden's slides. Um, so we'll have a PDF available to those on the Institute website. Of course, we have the recording from today and we'll have the written transcript. Encourage you to kind of check that out. Check out any of our other previous episodes. There's a nice landing page with all of them listed. Um, I would love to invite you to join us back here on February 10th with Dr. Angela Rasmussen, where we'll be talking specifically about variants and vaccines in that episode in two weeks from today, um, Wednesday morning, 8.30 Mountain Time, 10.30 Eastern Time, depending on where you're tuning in from. Uh, Nicole's going to drop in all of our links there to the chat. Thank you all for joining us today, and hopefully you have a wonderful, safe rest of your week. It was great to have you. Thank you.